Good evening. Can you hear me back in the back? Hopefully? Yes. Um, may I first ask you to turn off your mobile devices or mute them? My name is Molly Anderson, and as Executive Director here at the Athenaeum, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of not only the Athenaeum, but also our co-host this evening, the Museum of African American History out of Boston. Today, August 11th, 2016, I want you to close your eyes and imagine yourselves on this site 175 years ago on August 11th, 1841. And you're part of an audience that was assembled here for an anti-slave convention. And a young man recently escaped from slavery, named Frederick Douglass, rises to speak about freedom. And that evening represented the beginning of a highly successful oratorical career for Douglass. And he was to return to the Athenaeum four more times, 1842, 1843, 1850, 1885. In honor of this great American, we're fortunate to have with us tonight historian John Stoffer. Please join me in welcoming Lynn Duval Luz from our co host, the Museum of African American History, who will introduce Dr. Stoffer. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, no, we do better than that. Let's try that again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Now, that's much better. Thank you. That's the kind of welcome that's worthy of this wonderful program that the Nantucket Athenaeum has put together for you, and we are happy to co-present. Um, first of all, let me tell you that the Museum of African American History Boston and Nantucket is very pleased to be represented here this evening. And uh, along with me, uh, before we get to the purpose of this evening's program, I'd like to just point out a couple of uh, people who are in the house tonight. Um, my uh, associate, Diana Parkon, who is responsible for overseeing the management restoration, care, and tender, loving um, activities surrounding all of our historic sites in Boston and Nantucket. Diana Parkon. <laughs> also here tonight is Marsha Fader. Marsha, you in the house somewhere? Just raise your hand. Oh, okay, well, I just wanted to mention Marsha. Many of you probably know her. She is a um, preservationist who is working with us on the Nantucket campus, renovating the properties that we have there. We have five buildings on the Nantucket here, one open to the public, the African Meeting House. And also, we have uh, in the house, I'm happy to welcome Charity Grace, who is replacing um, our former site manager here on Nantucket, Kamal, McCarthy, who has gone off to Lithuania. Who knew, right? <laughs> Charity Grace. Very good. We'll be making announcements about Charity Grace's coming, so you'll be able to read more about her and more about the work that's happening here on Nantucket. But let me start by saying that um, the Washington Post wrote, among others, uh, wrote about John Stauffer, Zoe Trod, and Celeste Marie Bernier's book, and they said, Frederick Douglass escaped from slavery in Maryland in 1838 and forged a storied career as his 
era's preeminent champion of emancipation and civil rights. In his long campaign against racial prejudice, he marshaled not only the power of words, but also the power of visual images. Professors John Stauffer, Zoe Trod, and Celeste Marie Bernier have produced a beautifully crafted and contextualized compendium of the extant photographs of Douglas, images that reflect his passion for the emerging medium of photography and his conviction that the new technology could be a powerful tool for creating a truly democratic society. Uh, the New York Journal of Books said that it was, uh, that the authors had compiled what was uh, setting the standards for still relatively small field of endeavor, endeavor. So they recognize the work that they're doing as being groundbreaking. And the New Yorker called it a terrific new book. So not only is the book terrific, but John Stauffer, um, who I like to call a friend of the Museum of African American History, a uh, incredible scholar, and um, the co-curator of the Picturing Frederick Douglass exhibit, which is now on display at the Museum of African American History in Boston on Beacon Hill. So when you're there, please be sure to come by and see that between now and July of 2017. It will be available for you to see. Here on Nantucket, as of tomorrow, you'll be able to see a quilt that um, is a um, commemoration of the event that we're celebrating tonight, the 175th anniversary of this speech here at the Nantucket Athenaeum in 1841. So we're thrilled that that's going to be there. Please stop by the Nantucket campus at Five Corners to see that quilt. Um, it is an image of the quilt. Let me be clear, it is not the original quilt, so don't be surprised when that is the case. On your way out, I invite you to pick up a rack card that tells you about the exhibit and or a rack card that tells you more about the museum, Boston, and Nantucket campuses. But we're not here to really talk about that. We're here to talk about John Stauffer, and I will be brief because he will be eloquent. He's a professor of English and African and African American studies at Harvard University. And he is among the leading scholars of the Civil War era and anti-slavery. And the author and editor of more than eight books, I think this might be old, John, is that correct? More than eight books? He's here, um, and he'll tell you that. And more than 50 articles. Some of them are best-selling books featured um, featuring such subjects as Lincoln, John Brown, and of course, Douglas. And they've been nominated for, some of his books have been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, have won awards including History Book Club Featured Selection, the Iowa Writers Award, Boston Book Club Prize, the Avery Craven Book Prize, and the coveted Frederick Douglass Book Prize. So that's just a little scratch the surface introduction of John Stauffer. So please help me in welcoming Dr. John Stauffer. Thank you. Lynn, for that extremely generous introduction. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Amy, for hosting me here, and Diane. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, on this wonderful anniversary uh, in which Frederick Douglass launched his professional career as a public figure, uh, not in this particular building, but in the Athenaeum. And uh, so it's a great honor. I, I gave a talk here uh, in 2009 uh, of, for my book, Giants, on the parallel lives of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, and it was one of the most enjoyable talks that I've had. I also want to urge you or encourage you, if you're in Boston or when you're in Boston, to see the exhibit at the, Ma at the uh, Museum of African American History on Joy Street. Uh, I was a co-curator, but I had nothing to do really with the design of the exhibition. And it's, uh, in my view, the um, 
the, the most lavish and, uh, and uh, extraordinary exhibition of 19th century photographs. For curators to exhibit 19th century photographs, it's very difficult because most of the photographs are very small. There's actually a beautiful daguerreotype of a Wampanoag Native American in that case in the far left, and you see how small they are. And most exhibitions, the small photographs are in a glass case, there's reflections, and there's a long tradition of curators not wanting to enlarge them because it's then not authentic, it's a reproduction. And so the result is most 19th century photography exhibitions are a, a disappointment and, um, and boring. And this, the Museum of African American History has hired designers and, uh, and firms to um, blow up in beautiful, extraordinary detail Douglas's image, his life, and it's an intimate, uh, I think, extraordinary uh, exhibition, the best I've seen in uh, 19th century, as I said, and I have nothing to do with that. I just uh, wrote a few things for it from the book. Uh, I've written I've written on Frederick Douglass since I was a grad student. My first uh, published essay when I was at Yale was on Douglass and photography. So this book has really been a labor of love. And Zoe uh, had been one of actually Zoe was the best graduate student I've ever worked with, uh, and she also writes on photography and Douglas and African American uh, culture, as does Celeste. And it's it was a wonderful team uh, that um, we had. I felt we had that uh, resulted in this book. Um, and let me just summarize the book, and I'll show you some images, and I'll uh, field questions and answers. Um, Frederick Douglass was truly in love with photography. He sat for his portrait whenever he could. He, most of his life he was on the road, so whenever he was on the road, he'd go to a photographer's studio and sit for a portrait. He actually wrote more frequently on photography than any other uh, peer, any other 19th century American. He gave four separate talks. Uh, on photography. During the Civil War, he focused on photography. Three of them are, are appear in the book, two of them, uh, which I consider among Douglas's best speeches, uh, are published for the first time. Uh, and he was the most photographed American in the 19th century, hence the book's title, which is a stunning um, discovery by us uh, in the sense that most people think that Lincoln was the most photographed, or when they think of the most photographed or the most famous American, most at least white Americans, think that it's a white guy. The evidence for that is that there are 170 separate photographs of Frederick Douglass, meaning distinct poses as opposed to multiple uh, images of the same negative. Second is George Custer with 155 separate poses. Custer was nothing if not a shameless self-promoter. He was the boy general of the Civil War, the youngest general of the Civil War. Third is Red Cloud, the famous Native American. Fourth is Walt Whitman with 127, and fifth is Lincoln with 126. Now, as we point out in the book, U.S. Grant is a contender, but no one has analyzed his archive. No one has steeped himself in the photographs and added up how many separate photographs there are of U.S. Grant. Hal Holzer, who's a friend of mine, knows as much about the Grant archive as anyone. And when I asked him uh, how many separate photographs he thought there were of uh, U.S. Grant, he said about 150. I hadn't told him how many there were of Douglas. And his uh, estimate made me very happy. But we acknowledge that Grant is a contender. Douglas's passion for photography has been almost entirely ignored. As you all know, Douglas is best known as a writer, as an orator, as the abolitionist. He's the leading 19th century African American, the preeminent black leader of, of the century. We've celebrated his relationship with President Lincoln, uh, including um, my book on giants. He's the first black man to meet with and advise a U.S. president. He met with Lincoln three times in the White House. They publicly declared themselves friends at a time in which friendship connoted equality. So that was significant. The next time that a black man met with and advised a U.S. president was when Martin Luther King Jr. met with and advised Lyndon Johnson 
uh, nine times by my count in the 1960s, which gives you a sense of the long gap. Douglas met with every subsequent president after Lincoln until his death in 1895, which conveys something of his stature as a public figure. He was the first African American to receive a federal appointment acquiring, requiring Senate approval when he was appointed the Marshal of the District of Columbia. He was then Recorder of Deeds of, uh, of uh, the federal government, and then he was the first black ambassador when he was named minister to Haiti. He published three autobiographies, and he truly transformed the genre of autobiographical and memoir writing, and all of that is uh, fairly well known, and he still read. Increasingly, most high school students uh, should or uh, are becoming familiar with Douglas's narrative and his narrative which is this beautiful lyrical 90-page, uh, his first autobiography is widely taught in colleges. And it raises the question, why would a man who devoted his life to ending slavery, racism, and championing civil rights and human rights, why would he be so in love with photography and devote so much time to it? There are three reasons for that. One is the photography's democratic nature. Uh, uh, it was invented, the medium was invented in 1839 by Louis Daguerre and Henry Fox Talbot, and uh, Americans had a love affair with photography that surpassed that of every other nation. And it was the first time with the invention of photography, and, and the, the daguerreotype for multiple reasons was the medium that really circulated and was immensely popular. And for the, as Douglas said, for the first time in history, the poorest servant girl or slave could have his or her portrait taken that in detail and beauty surpassed that of what the most powerful king could have had 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Hence, the democratic nature. And photography was invented, we know from the history of photography and scholarship, not because Henry Fox Stout or de Geyer suddenly discovered the chemical process, but it was because of the demand, the rise of the middle class incurred, meant that people increasingly wanted portraits of themselves and their family. They wanted ways to represent themselves. And before the photograph, it was essentially a portrait which cost a lot of money or a miniature which cost a lot of money. And a daguerreotype by 1850, virtually every American could afford one, even poor Americans, there are numerous instances of slaves raising some money by doing odd jobs, surreptitiously uh, saving their money and acquiring photographs. Uh, so the democratic nature is, uh, is the first reason. And Douglas also recognized that photography and freedom emerged together because as Douglas knew, America's love affair with photography was chiefly limited to the free states. The slave states, there was a notable paucity of pho photography circulating for a variety of reasons. First, the slave states that lacked the cities and the navigable roads for a medium like photography to flourish, to travel or to disseminate. A second, the South lacked this craft ethos, uh, which was a central theme in the United States of democracy in the North, which is, no as Lincoln said, he called it the free labor ideal. No matter who you are, even if you're a black man or a woman, if you work hard and you acquire a craft or a skill, you can become an independent artisan or entrepreneur. Now, most Northerners fulfilled that as farmers, but some of them, photography was a fairly easy profession to get into, which I'll uh, detail a bit. But you know, Cooper, a uh, blacksmith, uh, a um, teacher, a doctor, those are all ways of fulfilling this um, entrepreneurial ideal. And in the Planter South, it was becoming, uh, the ideal was not to have to work with your hands, to become a slave owner. So the democratic nature was the first image. Uh, and here is Douglas's, when D I say Douglas and photography came of age together, this is a photograph of Douglas in 1841, right around the time he launched his professional public career as a paid lecturer. This is what Douglas looked like in 1841 in Nantucket. And it's a beautiful, beautiful daguerreotype. He's got this perfect afro. Uh, 
staring directly in the camera lens. It's a stunning image. Uh, it's owned by Greg French. It's in the Museum of African American History exhibit. Another example of photography's uh, popularity and democratic nature, and it led to Douglas giving four speeches on photography, is that D as Douglas said, and numerous other Americans said, photography, especially Matthew Brady's photograph of Abraham Lincoln taken the morning that Lincoln gave his Cooper Union speech, this photograph according to Frederick Douglass, according to Lincoln himself, who supposedly told Brady, this photograph made Lincoln president. Because after the, he gave his Cooper Union address, it was disseminated in Harper's Weekly, which is the most popular newspaper of the time. Think of Harper's Weekly like Time Magazine or Life Magazine in the mid 20th century. Everyone read it. And uh, it was widely disseminated. And it was an age in which people wanted to visually recognize their candidate. Lincoln was a dark horse. William Seward and Sam and Chase were the first two front runners in the presidential election. When Lincoln first came to New York, to the East Coast, to give his Cooper Union speech, many, if not most, Eastern journalists didn't even really know who he was, and many of them misspelled his name. They said he was Abraham, not Abraham. This photograph get him elected. And this image became ubiquitous in the campaign. Here's one of well, countless images of Lincoln from the Brady photograph circulating as a campaign button. Second reason is Douglas believed in photography's truth value. And here he recognized that photography was both a work of art and an immensely accurate technology. Douglas said in one of his newspaper articles that he did not trust white artists because he said most white artists, even if they want to represent a subject accurately, uh, their racism gets in the way when it comes to representing us blacks. But Douglas believed that the camera did not lie. The camera told the truth. So even a camera in the hands of a racist white would accurately, uh, objectively uh, uh, photograph uh, the subject. And in this sense, Douglas believed, understood the power of truth value as an orator, and Douglas was considered the, if not the, one of the two or three greatest orators of his day, far considered a far greater orator, for example, than Lincoln. And he's, all of his speeches were essentially abolition speeches. Douglas recognized that truth telling is the most powerful weapon against slavery and racism because slavery and racism are ways of trying to dehumanize other people. More than truth-telling, a truthful image represented abolitionists' greatest weapon. Uh, and so that was the other reason, a second reason for Douglas's love of photography. And the third relates to it is that for Douglas, photography highlighted the essential humanity, the essential and equal humanity of all people. He was very sensitive to the, the popularity of photography. Uh, over 95% of all photographs were portraits, so the demand for photographs were for people to have their portraits taken and those of their family and their friends. And Douglas understood or argued that only humans had the proclivity for pictures. In fact, in one of his speeches, he said, man is the only picture-making animal. Only humans have the capacity and p passion for pictures. And here he's criticizing and he's undermining a central premise of these very eminent white scientists. They were called ethnologists, the precursor of anthropologists. Louis Agassiz is, was probably the most prominent. There's still a building named after him at Harvard. And these ethnologists or biologists were trying to argue that blacks were subhuman. They were more akin to apes or other animals than they were to other humans. And there was a vogue among these scientists of collecting skulls, and they were trying to argue that the skulls of people from African descent were smaller than those of uh, people from uh, so-called uh, Caucasian descent. And Douglas just exploded that whole sensibility by saying what unites all humans is their capacity to represent themselves in the world. No other animal has the desire or the capacity or the ability to represent itself. 
they don't even recognize itself in the glass. And to this day, and with the one or two exceptions, that still holds true. Uh, people and the photo photography highlighted the degree that people were equal in their essential humanity, thus exploding the scientific arguments. For Douglas, the photography also highlighted his and other blacks' central claim to citizenship. As a speaker, as he always dressed up, he always looked immaculate, uh, he performed for his crowd in much the same way that he performed when he sat for a photographer. Here's a kind of representative image. He would, from the, uh, the first 1841 portrait through the Civil War, his signature pose was what one convert to the abolition cause who saw this photograph and heard him speak at the time he sold these photographs, she said he was majestic in his wrath. Both beautiful, handsome, majestic, he always dressed up, but wrathful because this was an age in which slavery is expanding. Douglas is a former slave and blacks are treated as subhumans. And yet he's presenting himself in the way he looks, the way he speaks, as someone who is more entitled to enter the wealthiest parlor or the White House than an American. Essentially, this photograph sends a message that Douglas is out-citizening white citizens at a time in which most blacks are denied the status of citizenship. The way in which photography becomes immensely powerful is through disseminating the image. Here's one example, and there are almost countless examples of this is a Casper Gears photograph in which he puts Douglas on the cover of Harper's Weekly uh, as an engraving. So the Illustrated Press hired engravers to cut engravings from a photograph. And what's crucial to recognize is that Americans believe that an engraving had the same essential truth value that a photograph had. And so, and in fact, the Illustrated Press ignored the transfer process. Instead of saying that it was an engraving based on a photograph by Casper Gears, it just says photograph by, uh, photograph by Gears, photograph of Douglas. Uh, and that's where it reaches uh, the masses. Most of the Douglas's photographs were studio portraits taken while on the road. Uh, but a few of them portray Douglas at the crafts, at the arts for which he was best known as a speaker and as a writer. And these images are extremely rare. This is Douglas delivering a speech on self-made men, became a signature speech, a speech at Tuskegee Institute before 5,000 people on commencement day 1892. Here's Douglas' mid-speech. And this is the young, probably the young Booker T. Washington at his side. Uh, the, 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 um, the, the technology of photography at the time was such that even in the 1890s, exposure times were in the seconds. The first image that I showed you of Douglas with the afro, he would have had to sit motionless for over a minute. The exposure times, uh, actually in 1839, were in the hours, and so the first portraits were not available until about 1841. And it wasn't until roughly 1900 that photography became an amateur craft where anyone could uh, take a picture. Before that, it really required three to six months to learn the process to, uh, to understand how the chemical process worked. Here's another photograph of Douglas at a speech, another very rare uh, 1851 anti-fugitive slave law convention in New York in which Douglas is sitting down, his friend, and colleague Rat Garrett Smith, the radical white abolitionist, is mid-speech, he's gesticulating right here, and Douglas will stand up shortly at, or after Garrett's speech to give uh, the keynote. And here is uh, Douglas uh, in his study writing at his Anacostia home in Washington, D.C., uh, with his uh, hat on the side. There is his violin right here. These are unusual photographs. The standard photographs of Douglas that he circulated were public in the 
And in fact, Douglas did not sit for his photograph as a personal, personal memento. In the book, there are no known photographs of Douglas with any of his five children, and no known photographs of Douglas with his first wife, Anna Murray. Since the book came out, we discovered at a uh, small uh, archive in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the only known photograph of Douglas with any of his children. It's Annie, his youngest child, who dies in 1860 from influenza. And this is it. This is uh, an a brand new find. Here's Annie, and Douglas is kind of slumped down, so he elevates her, makes her more dignified. But this is, a, this is not the photograph that Douglas would circulate. This is a personal uh, image uh, that uh, was unusual. He's not interested in photographs of family. He's, interested, he's not interested in circulating his private self. Uh, and uh, here's another uh, example of Douglas's uh, private uh, personal life. This is Douglas with his second wife, Helen Pitts. Uh, and her sister in the background. And here's a, another rare, very rare photograph of Douglas with the second wife, Helen Pitts, uh, on their honeymoon, and it's they're at Niagara Falls. This is a studio which has a false facade. You can see it by this weird stuff in the background here, uh, which is not representative. As I'll get into, Douglas, when he went into the studio, he wanted himself closely propped. He wanted the attention on himself. But this is a highly unusual uh, image uh, with this lavish facade with Helen Pitts uh, while they're on their honeymoon. Douglas is one of the main themes of Douglas's photograph, the 170 uh, photographs and counting, is that Douglas is one of the reasons why he photographed himself so much is that he wanted to convey the notion of a self that continually evolved as an orator, as an activist, uh, as a writer, he changed. In fact, who Douglas was in 1830, he's a slave. It's very different from who he is in 1840. It's very different from who he is in 1845. He conceived of the self as in a state of constant flux, of constant evolution. Uh, and that very idea of a self not fixed, but continually evolving, explodes the very ideas of slavery and racism because slavery depends upon a very low ceiling above which no one can rise. And racism, among other things, is defined by the idea that one group of people are permanently superior to another group. So Douglas, as he continually evolves, explodes uh, this entire notion. Douglas had such faith in photography that he believed that, in fact, as he says, the moral and social influence of pictures, particularly photography, is more important in the shaping of national culture than the making of its laws. The image, the faithful, truthful image, highlighting the essential equal humanity of an individual, is more powerful than the making of the laws. Hence, it's understandable why Douglas would write so much and sit so much for his photograph. So who photographed him? He was actually very inclusive on who he chose to photograph him. And photography as a profession was, as I said, very inclusive. From the beginning, women were among the most noted photographers. Uh, Nancy Fox Talbot, Henry Fox Talbot's wife, was one of the first ac great accomplished photographers. Uh, in the United States, from the beginning, women were accomplished photographers. There, there were tens of thousands of female photographers traveling or having studios, traveling in wagons, which was very common, or having studios. And African Americans, it was also a profession that was open. There were few barriers to entry. You didn't have to study with a master who would exclude you, like in painting or sculpture, and say, oh, you're not, you're not a white man, so I'm not going to take you on. You, have to, you, you didn't have to go to college. You didn't have to go to school. Basically, you acquired a manual to read about how you learned photography. The actual equipment didn't cost that much. And you needed to be able to experiment with the chemicals and have three, six months to do so, and then you're off and running. So it was something that even a, a poor or modest person could uh, launch his or her career, which is true with some of the most famous photographers. 
Lydia Cadwell was one of the greatest photographers in the United States in her day, and she photographed Douglas, and these are two of her Douglas photographs, gorgeous cabinet cards uh, from 1875. Cornelius Batty uh, became the instructor of photography for Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute, African-American photographer. Uh, here's one of his photographs of uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, there are four African Americans who photographed Douglas. Here's James Reed, who formed an interracial partnership with Phineas Headley in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And this is a photograph of Frederick Douglass with his grandson, Joseph. And it was at a venue in which Douglas gave a speech, and Joseph, who's a concert violinist, played in the violin. And so there's, this is a publicity photograph of a grandfather and grandson uh, having the photograph together. And here's James Hiram Easton, who is from Rochester, Minnesota, uh, a part of the radical abolitionist Easton family uh, from Boston. And this is uh, two photographs from uh, James Presley Ball. James Presley Ball ran one of the most uh, one of the most sought-after photography studios in Cincinnati which was the Chicago of its day. It was the, the cent central city of the West. And in Boston, Gleason's Pictorial, the first illustrated newspaper, in an, arg in an article said that the greatest photographer of the day was James P. Ball, an African-American. They wrote that Ball photographed with an accuracy and a softness of expression unsurpassed by any establishment in the Union. And this was, Boston was one of the central sites of major photographers. This newspaper chose Ball. Famous photographers also, well, actually I'll show you Ball's studio. Here's uh, Ball's great Daguerrean gallery of the West. It gives you a sense of what a photography studio was. There's a parlor where you'd sit and you'd wait to, see, to have your portrait taken and then they would develop it right away. So you'd receive your daguerreotype or your ambrotype or your carte de visite, uh, while you waited and looked at pictures. And the, this kind of a studio in photography, this was a model, really a revolutionary integrated space. The blacks, whites, men, women were both photographers and subjects. Famous photographers also photographed Douglas, Matthew Brady, stunning carte de visite, notice. So if you see with Lydia Cadwell, the, the uh, Whites, the, the light in his eye is so uh, channeling future, or uh, he's endowed with almost supernatural vision. John Hal Kent, another major photographer. This is Douglas in Rochester in his winter kind of Russian outfit. George Kendall Warren, who was one of the most prominent. Uh, Photographers of his day had a studio in Cambridge. He was well known for photographing celebrities like Douglas, famous people, but also uh, he was the most sought after photographer for college graduation classes. Uh, this is uh, Warren, and this is uh, the engraving that becomes uh, the frontispiece of Douglas's Life and Times from uh, the, third, uh, the first edition of his third autobiography. And Alexander Gardner photographed Douglas at Lincoln's second inaugural. Here is Douglas in the crowd, and here is Lincoln giving his second inaugural address. Uh, Lincoln invited Douglas to the second inaugural. Douglas wrote that he had a virtually a front row seat. You actually see it right here. He was invited to the reception in the White House afterward. It was the third meeting between Douglas and Lincoln. Douglas arrives at uh, the White House. Initially, he's turned away at the door because the policeman says no blacks are allowed to enter. Douglas says there must be some mistake. And when Lincoln sees him enter, he's in the elegant East Room surrounded by a crowd of whites. And Lincoln raises his hand and he yells out, here comes my friend Frederick Douglas. I saw you in the crowd today. Of course he did. Look at that. It's right there. He said, what did you think of my address? There is no man in these United States whose opinion I value more than yours. And Douglas responded, Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. It's a wonderful moment. You see it right here. Ironically, you also see John Wilkes Booth in the balcony here. 
There's Lincoln. There's Booth. He's scheming to assassinate him. Uh, and there's Douglas Fair. Kind of ironic, rich triad. Douglas saw his, ro his role in portraits as, as a, uh, in portraiture not as an objectified subject, but as an artist or performer. In a sense, I uh, argue that his understanding of the relationship between himself, the camera, and the photographer was a pas de trois, a dance for three. Uh, in fact, Douglas himself said that the photographic process was one of stirred serenity, stern serenity, which tended to produce something statue-like in the subjects. After all, you've got to pose and freeze that pose for 20, 25 seconds. This is on a bright, sunny day. Photography studios are also always on the top floor. You needed a, a direct sunlight. Douglas confronted this challenge much as a dancer did. He performed for the photographer, staying still during the exposure, appreciating the crucial role of timing, lighting, and set design. Douglas developed his own aesthetic. The majority of his images are closely cropped. Um, that uh, this, the uh, tradition of the day was for studios to have these elaborate props. In most of Douglas's images, there are few props. And the effect draws attention to Douglas himself. He wants a relationship between himself and the viewer, highlighting, and he wants to send a message. He wants to convert the viewer into an understanding that blacks are equal citizens. In essence, much as his central message as a speaker, as a writer, is racial equality and gender equality, was the foremost male feminist. There's few props to distract the fewer. He rejected the sentimental practice of using elaborate backdrops, painted scenes, such as the landscape that I showed you with uh, his second wife, Helen. When he used a prop, it was often significant. So here's Douglas sitting with Lincoln's cane. And the Lincoln's cane is not prominent. Mary Todd Lincoln gave Douglas one of Lincoln's canes after Lincoln was assassinated as a token of respect for their friendship. Here's uh, Douglas in a beautiful full coat, and he has a book on a table highlighting his the intellectual, his intellectual stature. And here's Douglas sitting in a chair with the arm carved into lion's head at a time in which Douglas, when he lived in his Anacostia home in, uh, at Cedar Hill that overlooked, that looked down on the U.S. Capitol, he was known as the Lion of Anacostia. So the Lion sits in the Leonine chair. Photographers loved working with him. One friend said she owned more than 20 pictures of Douglas and in 1870 she noted that the photographers are running after him to sit for them. Understandable. But if you're an ambitious photographer, it's a coup to get Douglas in your studio. And it was an agent of business, uh, particularly after beginning in 1859 when a carte de visite, which is the first kind of modern form, the paper card, carte de visite is a, no, a name for a visiting card. A photographer would invite Douglas or another famous person in the studio and say, I'll photograph you for free. And I'll give you 50 or 100 carte de visites to take with you. And so Douglas would come in. And the photographer then had the negative, and he would make thousands of other photographs to sell to people who came in. Because at, that, at this time, Americans acquired photo albums, much as before. We have photo albums on the computer now. But before computer, most of us had, our families had photo albums. But in the 20th century and early 21st century, photo album consisted of myself and my family and my friends. In the 19th century, they included the large family and friends, but they would also include the Queen of England and Frederick Douglass and Lincoln and people that you didn't know but you wanted to identify with. So I've come across countless photographs of Frederick Douglass in family albums in which the family never knew Douglass. And that's why photographers uh, were, wanted to, him to sit for them to sell these images. Douglas's portraits, like his speeches and writings, continually evolved, as I said, and let me give you a sense of this evolution. The first 
three known images suggest that Douglas is really exploring this new medium. Uh, this one, as I've already shown you, uh, he looks a little uncomfortable. It's a gorgeous image, but he looks statuesque or statue-like, as he would have said. The exposure time here would have been several minutes. Uh, and uh, a few years later, it was down to several seconds. Here's a 1843 daguerreotype where he is experimenting with what photography manuals taught photographers how to pose men of eminence, which is, a, they called it a visionary gaze, and they instructed the subject to look above or beyond the camera lens, as though you're a visionary. Douglas is ex experimenting with this pose, although there's, uh, there's a, a shadow in his eyes, and so he experiments with that look, ends up not taking it. And here's a third beautiful image from Douglas that, uh, when he gave a talk in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where he's looking down, not in the camera lens. So he's experimenting here in these first three poses with different looks, different um, personas, until he lands on this one. The majestic, wrathful, or wrathful, majestic look. Staring into the camera lens, beautiful, handsome, but defiant, demanding equality. This photograph, which is an engraving based on a lost daguerreotype, his fists are clenched as though he's ready to challenge in a fight someone who would deny his equal status. And this was, pro this was the most popular image uh, in, before the Civil War because this was the frontispiece of his second autobiography, which was the bestseller. It sold tens of thousands of copies. And Douglas would sell books when he gave a talk. He'd sell photographs when he gave a talk. When he'd have book signings, he'd sell photographs. The relationship between his public speaking, his writing, his photography was uh, richly symbiotic. Here's a rare, beautiful photograph of Douglas in profile. Also, his fist, his fist clench. The profile pose was highly unusual before the Civil War. It was reserved for men of eminence and wealth. It was less... Uh, uh, confrontational, so it doesn't have quite the um, wrath or the defiance, and yet here he's experimenting in a sense with the profile pose and his fists clenched. <clears throat> he sought a look of respect, dignity, the right of citizenship, and after the Civil War, he then acquires the profile portrait, which, because he becomes an elder states, uh, he becomes uh, within the Republican Party, and so he feels that he has earned the status, and also because the Reconstruction Amendments now legally guarantee equal protection before the law for the first time for African Americans. Uh, of the, th of the 170 poses of Douglas, three themes stand out. One is that he almost never showed a smile, with one noticeable, notable exception. A few years before he died, Douglas never wanted uh, to play into the racist caricatures of blacks as happy slaves or servants. And two years before his death, accolades streaming in, it's as though he finally lets his guard down, and he has this big smile. When his great-great-grandson, who wrote an afterword for our book, said he saw this portrait in our book, or we should gave him the galleys for the first time, he started crying, because as a little boy, he grew up, and this great ancestor, his great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, who he idolized, just seemed so stern, and he was afraid of him. And then when he sees this, he just he said he broke down. Second is the dignified, respectable citizen is a way to counteract the racist caricatures that proliferated uh, through the country. And third, his visual persona continually evolved from revolutionary freedom fighter staring defiantly into the camera lens in majestic, wrathful pose to the elder statesman looking above, beyond, often uh, in profile. Perhaps the most noticeable visual marker of Douglass's continual evolution is in his facial hair. Now, 19th century men experimented with facial hair, 
but I haven't come across anyone who experimented as much as Frederick Douglass. He tracked and often led the prevailing fashions. In 1840s, a clean-shaven look was most prevalent, writes Joan Severa, who has this wonderful book, Dressed for the Photography. If any of you are interested in 19th century fashion, that book is indispensable. In the 1840s, Douglas II was clean shaven. Then he grows, a, he grows these chin whiskers right here, which uh, lead, it, he, it, he leads the fashion in that. And they evolve into a crop fringe of mutton shop whiskers along, uh, a, uh, along the chin and jawline. Right there. So there's the chin whiskers. To the jawline. By the mid 1850s, uh, he was a trendsetter with a full beard and hair covering his ears. This was right here. This was a look that's not popular until almost 1860. He then began sporting a goatee, which he kept until about 1863. Here's Douglas in a goatee. And in, 18, in January of 1864, he anticipated another trend with a sporty walrus mustache right there. And then, in 1865, he couples his 40 walrus mustache with a ponytail. Frederick Douglass in a ponytail. 1873, he grows a full beard, and within a year, he shaves his chin whiskers while retaining bushy sideburns that looped up to connect his mustache. He maintained a neatly groomed full beard in 1875, anticipating the full bearded look uh, affected by authority figures in the 1880s, according to Joan Severa. And he let his beard gradually grow and whiten until his death. And this is a deathbed photograph taken several hours after he died, February 21st, 1895. The evolution of Douglas's appearance, like his portraits, indicated his status and his understanding of himself and of the value of what he called self-made men. The term was invented, came into the English language in 1842. In my book, Giants, I argued that Douglas and Lincoln are the two preeminent self-made men because of growing up from slave or um, poor white trash for Lincoln and becoming uh, the most, among the most significant figures of their day. Self-made man, and Douglas also embraced the idea of self-made woman because of his feminist stance, meant something very different than what it does for most of us today. Most of us, when we hear the term self-made man or self-made woman, think of, grow, of rising up to get rich. For Douglas, the true self-made man or self-made woman was someone who, as you continually evolve, you seek to reform and improve your society. So as you improve yourself, you improve your society. In fact, Douglas said the true self-made man or woman seeks to eradicate the sins of his or her society. It's no coincidence that his signature speech became the self-made man speech in which he emphasized the self-making was about reforming society, um, pressuring and pushing the nation to live up to its egalitarian genocide. Lincoln refers to Douglas essentially as a self-made man and as a reformer when he says that Douglas is one of, if not the most meritorious men in these United States. Douglas's portrait gallery contributed to his persona, persona as one of the nation's preeminent self-made man. And as a result of this extraordinary portrait gallery, Douglas's portraits have also served as an important visual legacy in the 20th century and beyond, inspiring art that could break down racial barriers in the 20th and 21st century. Douglas, in a sense, took advantage of the new technology of his day in much the same way that activists take advantage of the new technology of our day from Twitter and Facebook to cell phone photos and videos. So one of many examples is that many African Americans today say they won't leave home without a camera in the wake of the police murders and shootings 
in essence, they understand what Douglas emphasized 150 years ago, the camera's truth value and its ability to capture the essential humanity of every person. Now, both 150 years ago and today, we all know in theory that photography can lie like dogs. You can manipulate the image, you can airbrush out things, you can double, multiple, expose things. Photographers then could do it as well. But both then and now, we still have faith in the essential truth value of the camera. Douglas's portraits inspired artists to, rec to create thousands of murals, sculptures, paintings, prints, drawings, posted stamps, and magazine covers in the 20th and 21st centuries based on his photographs. His visual legacy protested lynching and segregation in the 20th and 21st centuries. It lobbied for civil rights and celebrated black power. It dignified the black body that white Americans have so often tried to destroy, as Ta-Nehisi Coates recently highlighted in his book. Let me give you some examples of murals with a particular focus on uh, Boston and New England, because this is where we are. This is the, uh, the um, Metropolitan Museum unknown photographer that became the cover of Life magazine in 1968. And this then inspired multiple um, murals and sculptures, uh, such as uh, this one. It's uh, the arc of history as long as the King Open School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, actually, about 10 blocks from where I live. This is another. The frontispiece to Douglas is My Bondage and My Freedom becomes the basis for the Lloyd and Lily beautiful statue of Frederick Douglass that's in Faneuil Hall in Boston. This is Deborah Browder and Heidi Schwartz, Frederick Douglass, based on John White Hearn's 1863 carte de visite. This is one of two postage stamps of Frederick Douglass. This is the 1995 postage stamp based on Samuel Fassett's card of the deed of 19, uh, of 1864. Notice how, uh, the painter or the designer for the postage stamps wonderfully inverted Douglass's finger from down to up. Uh, This is an open hands community uh, anti-racism mural in Belfast, Northern Ireland. If you go to Northern Ireland, or Belfast rather, the central image that you see in the city is this massive mural of Douglas. He uh, spent a lot of time in um, Ireland during his 1845 to 1847 trip uh, after the success of his first autobiography. Irish loved Douglas, he loved them, and there's been this mural here. It's based on Matthew Brady's part of the disease. And a, a similar mural is in New Bedford. It's a labor history mural also based on Matthew Brady's part of the disease. One other one in just the Massachusetts or Boston area. And there are thousands, tens of thousands, actually, of these murals throughout the country. We could only put a few into the book. Arnold Hurley's Frederick Douglass of Boston, 1967, was destroyed in 19. It's based on Dennis Borden's cabinet card. Here's the Douglas of uh, the 1960 uh, flower child, um, uh, hippie Douglas. And here's Douglas, the gang of peace, Douglas with other uh, major black leaders, uh, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, uh, W.B. Du Bois, uh, and uh, Douglas. These are just a sampling. Douglas helped launch one of the great battles in American history, a battle between racist stereotypes and dignified self-possession. Across 50 years of photographs, Douglas fought for the public image of African Americans as equal citizens. Across the next 120 years, in Douglas's visual afterlife, the photographs have fought on. Thank you. Happy to take uh, questions, comments, criticisms. Yes. <laughs>
How do you count? Douglas. <laughs> so there are a few. So there are a few. So when Douglas would go into a studio, and he would um, almost every photographer would take multiple exposures. And one of the reasons that I feel very confident, or Joey and I feel very confident that Douglas had this real sensitivity to photography is there are a few instances where there's multiple images of Douglas, and the one he chose to disseminate to get reproduced is always the best one. And there are a few um, cities in which there are five or six or four separate images, and there are a couple with Douglas has last photos, which you can see blinks. <laughs> but remember, the exposure time, it's not a fraction of a second, a tenth of a second, or a tenth of a second, it's, it's several seconds. And so if you blink really quickly, it was enough so that it did not really distort um, the final numbers. Uh, the, the main problem was just keeping still so that you could get a detailed, a detailed uh, image. Uh, the, but there are a couple uh, in the book, in the, the uh, catalog raising A, which we include all of the images where you see others, which I was supposed to have exactly the reason why. And it's, I, I think that there are actually probably hundreds more photographs of Douglas because if you compare his archive with that of, say, Custer or Whitman or Lincoln, because there are lights in the way in which Douglas, Douglas was out of print in 1900. He was virtually unknown from 19, by whites from 1900 until 1980s because as uh, white Southerners and white Northerners wanted to reunite after the horror of the Civil War, one of the ways in which they reunited is by excluding slavery, saying that the war was not about slavery. It was about this uh, inevitable conflict between an industrial North and an agrarian South. And so no one was to blame, and no one was at fault, and no one was morally culpable. Both sides were gallant, both sides were right. Conflict. And if that's the case, what do you do with Douglas? This radical abolitionist, you have to either demonize him or erase him from public memory. So Douglas, who is the most photographed American in the 19th century, his books are among the best-selling books in the 19th century. Uh, he's a household name by 1846. He dies in 1895. From 1900 until 1950, Douglas is out of print. African Americans are reading him, but they're reading because they get books from the library. They make copies. He's a huge inspiration for African Americans. And when he comes back into print in 1950, it's with the, uh, the communist press, international publishers, which it sells five copies because of the way it's communist for demonized. Gives you it. And so when archivists are collecting photographs, when they see a leading white figure in the 20th century, yeah, let's have an archive. But they didn't collect those. So a lot of these photographs have only been collected really since the modern civil rights movement, since the 60s. So a lot of archives, they just have one in there. There's only a handful of cities in which there are more than one. There's more than one photograph. Whereas virtually every other major white figure in their photographic archive, each city has four or five separate. Yes. Are the actual the actual speeches you made here recorded somewhere? The speech you made right here. Yes. Uh, part of it is in the Frederick Douglass papers by Yale University Press, um, which uh, and it's an ad, it's a as told to recording. So we have they, they didn't have a a, a a journalist transcribing the speech. Right here. But there are a number of speeches. Well, there's in that book, the first book of speeches, there are a few um, actually transcriptions of Douglas speech in 1841. It's a great question. So we don't have a transcription of the speech. Journalists were trained to be able to transcribe speeches as the person spoke. Uh, and uh, but we, we can reconstruct what that speech was like based on the existing evidence. And in 1841, I, I, I'll say it's Douglas, as an ex-slave, um, when he was hired after he spoke here in 1841 as a paid lecture, 
Um, the he would, the anti American Anti Slavery Society, which is the main abolition organization, needed Douglas more than Douglas even did. He became a professional lecturer. And the reason for that is because Douglas was the first lecturer who had been a slave and could speak firsthand of what slavery was like. So what he did on the lecture circuit throughout the northern states, he couldn't go south because he'd be recaptured or lynched. But he would tell the story of his life. And he essentially told the truth about what slavery was, which was an attempt to dehumanize another person. And that was the most effective way of converting his audience, audiences to abolitionists. And it's one of the reasons why when he publishes his narrative in 1845, he writes it in three months. Because he had been practicing on the lecture circuit telling the story over and over again. And the book is, it's lyrical, it's a masterpiece. But he tested it out with his story with live audiences. And he was such a good lecturer that what led him to write the autobiography is why it's increasing. He said, there's no way that you could have been a slave. You're too brilliant as a lecturer. You're too sophisticated with language. You must be a fraud. And that's the greatest threat to his power. Challenging the truth for him. So that's what we need him to um, tell all. When he was on the lecture circuit from 41 to 45, he didn't name names because he's a fugitive from justice. He didn't say who his master was, where he was from. He had to be vague about where exactly he was a slave. And uh, so it was really the story um, and instances of his life were the most powerful. And in a few instances, we know he pulled his shirt off, turned his back to show his scars. And he was also able early on, he, it was common early on where he would, he would satirize and mimic slavery and draw howls of laughter. And then he increasingly realized that the um, humor that he elicited uh, cut against the gravity of the message. And so he uh, increasingly downplayed the satire of humor. And the lecture circuit also changed by the, really the late 1840s. Uh, the Lyceum circuit became a main venue and it became uh, one of the most lucrative venues for lectures. You could make a lot of money, but it was a circuit in which you were expected to write out your lecture and then it was published. And Douglas commanded a higher speaking fee as a lecturer uh, than any other American uh, since the college. Sought after So that's a very long answer. <laughs> yes. Did he ever speak about John Brown? Did Douglas ever speak about John Brown publicly? Yes, it's a, uh, another great question. Douglas became a close friend of John Brown in 1847. Um, in fact, he in his newspaper uh, he said that he met with John Brown. He said Brown, although a white man, is in essence black because uh, he feels slavery as though it's a fire in his bones. And Douglas uh, knew that Brown was essentially a warrior. Brown's greatest contribution to the cause of ending slavery was as a warrior. He went to Kansas to help um, fight against pro-slavery Southerners who went to Kansas to, make, to try to make that territory a slave state. And Brown was not a good speaker or writer. Brown, John Brown could not write a gra grammatically correct sentence to save his life. Douglas, we know, edited um, a number of documents that Brown wrote. The provisional constitution that would govern those areas that Brown hoped to liberate from slavery when Douglas raided Harper's Ferry, Douglas edited. Uh, Brown asked Douglas to go to Harper's Ferry and be his right hand man. And Douglas said, I'm not going to go because you're going to steal traffic, you're going to die. And I don't want to die. And he spent two days trying to convince John Brown not to go. And John Brown went anyway, and he dies. He becomes a martyr. And Douglas had to flee because there are letters in Brown's backpack between himself and Douglas at Harper's Ferry. So there is a warrant put out for Douglas's arrest as an accomplice, as an accessory before the fact. And at the time, Douglas was giving a speech in Philadelphia 
And in fact, the president, uh, President uh, Buchanan, sent out an arrest warrant through the telegraph office to the chief of police in Philadelphia, and the telegraph operator was a man named, named John White Hearn, who was an abolitionist. And he received the arrest warrant that he was supposed to deliver to the policeman. He pocketed it. He goes to Douglas, where he's giving the speech. He said, you got to get out of town right now. <laughs> Douglas does. He goes to Canada. Then he delivers the, <laughs> the warrant to the policeman. So Douglas is safe in Canada, and he goes to England until the affair over Harper's Ferry dies out. And John Wayne Hearn becomes a photographer. And Douglas sits for John Whitehurn, and there are more separate photographs of John Whitehurn than any other photographer. He, he, uh, he, he, he was very loyal. He repaid loyalty. Uh, so the other way of framing it is Douglas, a lot of scholars have said Douglas was opposed to violence, which he wasn't. Douglas recognized, as John Brown did, that slavery depends upon violence. Violence is the hinge around of slavery. Without violence or the threat of violence, slavery cannot exist. And so Douglas, like John Brown, like many other abolitionists, recognized that the slave nation of the United States constituted a civil war. So to say you're a peace man, a pacifist, is in a sense absurd. We're in the midst of this massive civil war between slave and master. And Douglas and you felt that, without question, that if we could end slavery peacefully, we would, you know, that's far more proper. But given a choice between ending slavery through violence and not ending slavery at all, it's not even a question. It's not even a question. And it wasn't for virtually any other abolitions. So, so in fact, when Brown is captured, Douglas writes a newspaper column from Rochester, I mean, from Canada, where he's, um, safe, and he essentially acknowledges his guilt for not following John Brown, says he feels guilty, and then calls John Brown uh, one of the great revolutionary heroes. He's countering these uh, attacks, saying John Brown is mad. John Brown is insane. He must have been insane to lead an army with these blacks and whites into Harper's Ferry. And Douglas said, if you're going to call John Brown insane, you might as well call the Founding Fathers insane. Uh, Douglas also recognized that his greatest contribution to the cause was through his photographs, his speaking, and his writing. Whereas John Brown's greatest contribution was as a warrior. You could say, I, in fact, I've used the term, the best way to understand Frederick Douglass is that he was a prudent revolutionary. And fortunately, prudence trumped revolutionary impulse in choosing not to go to Harper's Ferry. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Uh, Ted Dubray makes an appearance in your lecture, the yeah. 101 history of the future of photographers, the Brady uh, and photography is an institution that changes the way that Americans see war and view war permanently. Did photography have an effect on the way that Americans view slavery? Not just escape slaves, but I'm just thinking to myself, I don't think I've ever seen a daguerreotype. Of uh, invasion or you know, it reintroduce Americans to the institution of slavery itself. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a great question. So um, the question is about uh, that Brady helped transform America's understanding of war, which you're absolutely right. In fact, I have a, I've written on the importance of photography in the Civil War and the Crimean War before it. Um, but did it also have an influence on in how Americans? understood slavery. Yes, it's one of the reasons why Douglas was so in love with photography that um, Douglas is a former slave. Douglas called himself a fugitive, essentially a slave, even after he was legally free. So Journer Truth was another former slave who, was, who photographed, sat for the photograph virtually whenever she could. And there are numerous, numerous portraits of African Americans, all of them presenting themselves before the camera, much like Douglas, as dignified citizens. And they were widely circulated, none nearly the extent to which Douglas was.
But that helped dramatically to, especially during the Civil War, to convince Northerners that blacks were citizens. The other, the main way that, that uh, convinced Northerners, Northern whites, that blacks should be accorded the status of citizenship is by 1864, virtually every Northern white recognized that the only way that the Union could win the war is through the crucial support of blacks as soldiers, as laborers, as spies and intelligence people. And everyone acknowledged that. And Harper's Weekly was, I think, brilliant. Harper's Weekly has essentially covered the war for the North. Virtually every Northerner followed the war visually through Harper's Weekly. And virtually every, if not every week, every other week, Harper's Weekly had this engraving, often based on a photograph of an African-American highlighting the crucial importance of that African-American in the war effort, uh, it, was, it was indispensable. It's, it was indispensable. It's a great question. Yes? Uh, you mentioned in passing that uh, Mr. Douglas was a feminist. Yeah, this seems extraordinary in the mid-19th century. Yeah. How so was he a feminist? So the feminist, women's rights or feminist movement grew up with, it emerged out of the abolition movement. Yeah, the American Anti-Slavery Society was the first society that treated women as equals. Uh, they encouraged that, that women to be public speakers, which was, was not allowed in any other venue. Uh, the American Anti-Slavery Society acted on their religious and other impulses, which uh, the religious impulses that God has no respect for person. In God's eyes, all humans are equal, whether you're black or white, man or woman. And they sought to realize that. And so uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, Sarah and Angela Grimke, all of the leading feminists were also abolitionists. The leading abolitionists were also feminists. Way Boy Garrison was also a feminist. And uh, Douglas, Douglas has said his proudest accomplishment or his proudest work was his, his work for women because it was the most selfless. Most of his protest was advocated on behalf of fellow blacks, but he said his proudest was uh, his, uh, advocating for women's equality. So, one of many examples, the first um, convention, the first women's rights convention in world history, as many of you know, it was the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Douglas was there with a few other men, and Women's equality at that time was considered so revolutionary that, that mostly women, but there were thousands of people, debated a resolution on whether or not women should have equal suffrage. And initially, a number of women said that's just too radical, too revolutionary. We shouldn't support it. And Douglas stood up and gave an eloquent address defending the importance of equal suffrage. Universal suffrage, and in part because of his, his speech, that resolution passed. Uh, and throughout his life, uh, the, the timely instances spoke out on behalf of women. He was chiefly, most of his speeches were for racial equality, but he also, as I said, as I emphasized, uh, spoke out on behalf of women. Yes? Okay, one more question. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, second wife picture. Helen and um, was she in fact Caucasian? It looked like a picture like she. Yeah, was. Helen Pitts was uh, a white woman. So Douglas uh, and Anna Murray, his first wife. There's no known photograph of Douglas with her. Anna was an African American. She was a free black and never been a slave. They met in Baltimore when he was still a slave. So he essentially married up. She was part, in large part responsible for Douglas uh, being able to escape. It was her money that allowed him to acquire a train ticket, to buy a train ticket, ticket for money that allowed him to acquire a passport to pass as a free black sailor when he went to New York. She died. They had a, um, well, Anna Marie never became literate. Was buried with Douglas who cut his eye teeth on being a writer and an intellectual. Um, they grew apart. Uh, and, but they still loved each other. She was uh, she raised five children. She was uh, really heroic 
she dies in 1881, and Douglas, the plunges Douglas into a depression. Um, and he had known Helen Pitts, who was a white woman from uh, Irish ancestry. Uh, it was not a politically correct marriage. She was Douglas's secretary, and she was 20 years younger. But they actually had a beautiful, wonderful marriage. She was uh, an intellectual, avid reader, an activist, uh, and so they worked together. She was responsible for preserving Douglas's home, which is now the National Park Service and the Costa site. And Douglas was not, uh, he did not handle his marriage to Helen Pitts uh, in the most uh, opportune or felicitous way that normally did. He handled it by saying that in my first, Douglas himself was a mulatto. His father was a white man. He never knew who his father was. It was probably um, either Thomas Paul or Aaron Anthony, one of the two masters. And Douglas said, my first wife was uh, the color of my mother's hue. And the second wife was the color of my father. And his family did not like him. A lot of activists, whites and blacks, did not like him. What he should have said is that I've devoted my life to racial equality. I've devoted my life to breaking down racial barriers such that it shouldn't be a big deal for a white and a black to get married. But for a lot of reasons. It's Thank you all.